right, good to see you tonight. Let's go back to uh, John 4 again. John chapter 4. Okay, John chapter 4, we'll begin reading in verse 7. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a widow of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, Thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But what, whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go, Call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. And that saidst thou truly. The woman said unto him, Sir, I believe that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou? Or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Our message tonight is uh, titled, Lead a Horse to Water. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with the old proverb, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. And that is true in witnessing. Uh, if you turn back to, put your hand here, and turn back to Mark chapter 10. Uh, in this chapter, we have a man who uh, seems to be thirsty. In verse 17, it says, When he was gone forth in the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. So here's a guy... Uh, He's rich, he's got on nice clothes, no doubt. He comes running up and kneels 
gets on the ground in front of the Lord Jesus, certainly he seems to be uh, pretty intense or earnest at least. Um, verse 19, Jesus said, Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth up. And uh, one of the other Gospels that record this says, he, he said, What lack I yet? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Master, all these... Ha oh, excuse me. Then Jesus said, Then Jesus beholded him, in verse 21, Loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, Go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, Give to the poor, And thou shalt have treasure in heaven, And come take up the cross and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. So certainly we, we've got to preach the truth when we're witnessing. We've got to explain the gospel to them. Um, in the book of Acts, in talking about Paul's witnessing in the uh, synagogues, he uses the word persuade. So he is using arguments from the scripture. He's, he's showing them, trying to prove what he's saying. Uh, certainly, I think we need to uh, do the best we can to get people's interest, to get their attention. Uh, but you don't want to focus on something worldly in order to get their attention or something like that. But uh, this rich man here in Mark 10, he, he certainly understood, seemed to be very earnest. But um, after Jesus explained it to him, he left. He said he was sad. He was troubled, I guess. But he, when he understood, he rejected it. Um, I guess he thought it was too much to require. But if we look back then at uh, John 4, at the woman at the well, here we have in, in um, Mark 10, we've got a guy running up to Jesus looking for him. But apparently... Because of the Lord's omniscience, he sat down and waited for this woman because he wanted to witness to her and knew she was going to be there. And uh, he gets her attention or gets a conversation with her by asking for help and engaging her. In verse 7, it says, There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. So he initiated the conversation. That didn't mean we always have to do that if we're going to witness, but... We can take, try to take any conversation we're in and, and turn it uh, toward the gospel. Uh, one of the things which I, I think is the best situation, but there are going to be times when you'll have opportunity to witness to a number of people, but in this case, it's just one-on-one. -on -one. There, there's nobody there to interrupt, and I'm sure all of us have started witnessing somebody many times, and somebody else interrupted or inter or some kind of disruption or something like that. In fact, some of the most, I'm just going to use the word, aggravating situations I've ever been is when a Christian actually interrupts and ruins the, the opportunity, well, at least somebody that professed to be saved, uh, ruins the uh, opportunity to, to witness somebody, give the gospel to him. But here, there, there's none of that. Um, and perhaps if the disciples had been there, they would have interrupted. I don't know. They were interested in lunch, and uh, they they might. It says when they got back, they were wondered, you know, what in the world is he doing talking to this woman? Um, but it's good to be able to talk to somebody. Usually, if it's just the two of you, uh, they're I, at least in my experience, they're more likely to talk about what they believe and what they think about religion. Uh, and usually if you've got a group, this is not always the case. You could have a family. You could be like uh, Peter in Acts chapter 10 where he gets there, he's been invited there, and there's a whole family and friends and everything. They've all come to hear the gospel. They're there for that reason. So you may have that kind of situation. But uh, Jesus engaged her obviously ignoring social customs. Uh, in verse 9, 
It says, Then said the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which as am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Now, there are a lot of passages in the Bible where I, I wished I could have been there and see, you know, just see what happened. One of my, I think it would be the most, one of the most favorite was when Joseph told his brothers, he said, I'm your brother Joseph. <laughs> and they had sold him into slavery. They thought he was dead, you know, and now he's this extremely powerful man who has all the opportunity to get back over him. Or when uh, the, the ruler of Babylon says his knees were smiting together when he saw the handwriting on the wall, you know, things like that. But there are so many different ways that I could, in this passage, see this woman responding. She could have been sarcastic. She could have been seductive. She could have been all, all kinds of things. She could have been, you know, quizzical. What, I mean, what are you talking about? Um, and so we don't really know, when, just like in verse 9. I mean, what are you doing talk with me? If she did, uh, this is a woman that's been very loose morally. She could have been making sort of a proposal with her, with her voice there. We don't, we don't know. But regardless of that, Jesus did not answer her question. And that's one thing. Uh, a lot of times when you're a witness to somebody, they may ask you a question that you know is going to take you off out in the, in the weeds, you know, uh, and he, he just ignored that question. He, he did that with Nicodemus in, back in chapter 3. Uh, he just ignored, completely ignored what Je uh, Nicodemus said to him, and he just said, Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you'll, you're not going to see the kingdom of God. So... Uh, sometimes, a lot of times, it's important to be direct and to make sure that we stay on target uh, about what we're trying to accomplish. And if you don't, a lot of times you'll, you'll never really get to present the gospel. But he does that in verse 10 when he says, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, Thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. So, he, he first of all, um, makes this, I, I, maybe he was trying to pick her interest or get her interested when he said, if you knew the gift of God. So, she's obviously not thinking about salvation. He is. And if you knew who it was you were talking to, <laughs> now, you know, you get these uh, people, do you know who I am? You know, are they, that's not what he's doing. He's, I get, I think he's trying to get, keep her interest here. But then he says, he brings it this thing about living water. So there they are. Uh, they don't have running water in their houses. So it's a big deal to have fresh water. She's come there just for that purpose. And... Uh, I don't know if it was the summer or winter when, when it was, but she said, he said, I, I would have given you living water. Now, that phrase sometimes means running water in the Bible uh, in, in, time, in old times. But here he's talking about something completely different, and she doesn't understand it. So you'll, you'll encounter that. And if they ask the right question, their question will give us opportunity to lead them into other truth. The woman said to him in verse 11, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Now again, her question is... It would be an easy getting off off the track, getting away from the gospel. But at least it shows that she's interested. She's going to continue talking with him. And so he plows right ahead. Verse 13, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. Now, 
Jesus did not say that to Nicodemus. He just went right to this issue. He was interested in eternal life. He, uh, Nicodemus was. That's the reason he came to talk to Jesus. He had questions about it himself. He was a teacher, a religious man. Uh, at least he was somewhat honest with himself. But this woman it just came to get some water. But Jesus knows what type of woman he is. He knows all of, she is. He knows all about her. And she's a woman who's, we just, we'll just put it this way, she's a five-time failure. She's been married five times and divorced five times. Now, if you don't think that has an impact on somebody, um, you just never have thought about it before. And I don't care how uh, much people downplay marriage and how, whether it's important or not, and certainly the way some of uh, you know the great personalities in TV and movies, sports or whatever, uh, that's a defeating thing. And so he, he knows this. He knows that her life... She's experienced thirst, and she doesn't even know what it is. It, it bothers her about the way that she's lived. And so he makes scriptural promise. Verse 13, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. Now, that sounds like a sales pitch. <laughs> it's kind of like making a promise. You know, I got this, this new product here, uh, and it makes these audacious claims, but she's starting to understand that, that this guy is really addressing her needs genuinely and spiritually and makes this promise about and I, I think she's starting to get it now he's addressing the emptiness in my life the unsatisfaction lack of satisfaction I have in my life and so forth and so she admits her need she's starting to catch on verse 15 the woman saith unto him sir give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. And Jesus replies, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. So she's admitting that she has a spiritual need. She, she's not just blowing him off, you know, a bunch of religious fanatics or something like that. And he helps her with that. He helps her realize that She's thirsty, and it's for a reason. She's not satisfied because her life is marked by sin. And so in verse 17, the woman answers and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, and that thou sayest truly. Now, I can tell you this. I believe that if he was just letting her have it, that that probably would have been the end of the conversation. But he's telling her, I know who you are, I know what you're like, and he's wanting to help her. He has something that can help her. Um, and so, you know, even a woman like her, is spiritual, at least in their minds. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. And so she starts talking religious or spiritual. And she's talking about worship in the, you know, the right place, Jerusalem or there in Samaria. And uh, he's just like a good Baptist, and he tells her how worthless religion is. Verse 21, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh 
when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. And this is something you'll have to deal with at some point because at least in the southeast, a high percentage of people have been in church. And a high percentage of those people who have been in church didn't get anything out of it. Uh, They'll say something about the hypocrites in church. And what can you do but agree with them, but you don't want to get off on a rabbit trail on that. Uh, basically, he, he turns it to the truth that Israel is God's chosen people. What, what an offensive thing that must have been to her. Um, since she's a Samaritan and uh, would have been considered a uh, half-breed, not just racially, but primarily spiritually, religiously, because she would have held to part of the Old Testament and then part Babylonian religion. That's, that's where, where the Samaritans came from. You know, when Babylon conquered Israel and they carried off some, but they sent people there to uh, inhabit the land of Israel and they intermarried and they mixed their religions together. And so he just tells her that. Um, but he talks about true worshipers, worshiping in spirit and in truth. And in all likelihood, that's what she's missed. She's found out that sin is not satisfying. It's, uh, it's degrading. It's, uh, it, it never fulfills the promises that it makes. And religion's the same way. And so he's bringing these things out, and he says something to her that probably nobody else has ever said in verse 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And she comes up with what she probably thinks is a good answer. I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. And I believe at that point she thought, that that was going to be the end of the conversation. You can't know, I can't know, we'll all know when the Messiah comes. But he says, that's me. So, um, at this point, there's been a lot going on in this woman's heart and mind. And one of the things is, here's a man who's a Jew, Uh, they're there alone and he's talked to her about the deepest needs of her soul and he's told her that he as the Messiah could quench the thirst of her life, her soul and our our problem a lot of the times is this it's it's easy you know in the south you're supposed to talk to her, greet everybody speak to them it's easy to talk about the weather or about sports or politics. Or, well, you had to be careful about that, I guess. But, you know, to establish some kind of uh, conversational connection, but it never really shows an interest in somebody. It's just, uh, it's just talking. But he did that. And I, to... Try to lead somebody to water. That's what we, we should be doing. Obviously, the Holy Spirit was working in this woman's life. And the things that Jesus said touched her heart and mind. And uh, she believed. He, he didn't give her a lot of truth here. He said that he was Christ, uh, the Messiah, He talked about true worshipers. He told her that her religion couldn't help her. Told her that her sin was a problem. And uh, 
That was enough for her to believe. And I really do believe that a major part of getting people interested in the gospel is to show our interest in them. And again, you, you and I can't, we can't make somebody drink, but we, we can have a genuine interest in them and not be ashamed of the truth. And so I think we need to keep those two things in mind primarily. We've got to be intent on seeking to help people and giving them the truth. So um, just some examples here. There's some, John gives some very good personal witnessing things. Like say chapter three, it's uh, Nicodemus. And uh, chapter four, her and a whole, a whole a community, a city that got to hear because of her. Chapter five, there's a uh, guy that's an invalid. Uh, just think about somebody who's f physically incapable and the natural reaction that we have is to want to avoid them. And Jesus went right to this man and uh, helped him. And so if we, if we, have, we got to have a genuine interest in souls and their eternal destiny and give them the truth that they need. All right. Father, we thank you for these examples in Scripture of our Savior and his love and concern for souls, uh, even those that a lot of times we wouldn't be interested in talking to, that we'd want to avoid. Lord, we thank you for your love for souls and help us to have that same burden and to feel the hurts and needs of those around us and to give them the truth. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.